carry on with this, uh, these market ideas now. Let's consider something else uh, where somebody tries to intervene in the market in some way and then typically the market strikes back. And often the intervention or the intervening in the market is ignored and people instead concentrate on the consequence. Take a look at this. Uh, imagine, for example, somebody sets up uh, a price above the equilibrium price. So uh, somebody tries to fix the price higher than what it would be in a normal equilibrium. We refer to this as a price floor because the price is trying to, trying to push itself back down to an equilibrium and something is stopping it. And we, we refer to this as a price floor. This is going to cause uh, a, a, a surplus of some sort. The quantity supply is going to be too large normally. And uh, so as a result, uh, the people that are trying to fix the price are going to have to do something. One way to do this is uh, create a cartel, which restricts the supply. Uh, and then there's people that try to get out of the cartel because they want to sell at a lower price. So there has to be kind of an enforcement mechanism to make this work. Another way to do this is just to sur live with the consequences of having an extra surplus of some sort. Uh, examples of something like this, we have actually a situation like this with milk in Canada. Uh, the price is above the equilibrium price. Uh, this is supposedly to, uh, to help dairy farmers. Uh, they've formed a cartel which makes it illegal to import any milk into Canada, include milk in any, any cheese. Um, you have to have a special permit to, uh, to produce milk. Uh, something similar exists in the taxi industry in Montreal and other cities. Uh, it exists uh, um, in, in a, a variety of areas. Egg production also in Canada operates this way. At least to, uh, 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 usually typically a series of problems. And uh, uh, sometimes even black markets as people try to sell something on the side to. Um, and often this is what attracts attention. And the fact that there's some kind of a mechanism to keep the price uh, fixed. Another example of this would be minimum wage, uh, where it's illegal to hire somebody below a certain a certain wage. In this case, uh, it just leads to um, excess supply, which in this case would be excess on um, uh, people looking for work that can't find a job. And then, of course, the employers are able to pick and choose amongst the people that they that they want to hire. Uh, another possibility would be a case where somebody uh, arbitrarily fixes the price below the equilibrium. In this case, we call it a price ceiling, where um, the price wants to go up, uh, meaning you say it wants to return to an equilibrium, but it can't. Uh, this, in this case, what we've got is a problem of shortage. The demand is greater than the supply. And this might lead to things like um, empty shelves, queues, uh, long waiting times. Anytime you see something like a long waiting time, you have to phone a 1-800 number and you're stuck and waiting. Or anytime you have to wait in a queue, then typically what it means is there's something keeping the price too low. And uh, um, we, we refer to it as a price ceiling. And then people often complain about the lineups, uh, the, the waiting times and so on, ignoring the fact that the, the real problem is that there's a price ceiling, a fixed, fixed price. Uh, this is the kind of thing that happened in the Soviet Union. Uh, frequently because they had fixed prices and so there was long waits to get something. We have something similar in Canada with uh, with our health system. If you want to go to the uh, the hospital you typically have to wait at the emergency room for a long time, several months to get a specialist and this is due to the fact that we've uh, decided that the price in effect is, is zero and we pay we pay for these health services through our taxes but the important point is that the price mechanism, the price signal is uh, is not used to uh, to decide how, how, how we receive service and consequently Another example, too, is traffic jams. Uh, uh, in effect, there is no price for using the road. Anybody can use it, so the demand is greater than the supply. Okay, the last, this last idea I want to look at is, um, uh, in some ways, it's probably the most important aspect of, uh, of a market. Uh, and certainly, I, I think that the person that, um, uh, that invented prices, if you will, numbers, in effect, this would be several 10, 20, 40,000 years ago, uh, probably did it based on this, this concept. Um, if you think about it, uh, numbers were first invented as a in terms of trade, and then, of course, then they led into things like accounting and so on. Uh, for, but primarily, it was used for, for trade. And it was to, to be able to count and say that I'm giving so much of this to get so much of that. And, and the, the use of this is that it leads to uh, what I refer to as a truth-telling device or a, uh, a way to determine whether somebody's being honest or not honest. And I want to show you how that would work. So here we've got a, an equilibrium, like before with my milk example. So we've got the price of milk is $2. Equilibrium price is $2.60 uh, per liter. And we've got the quantity sold, uh, quantity bought is equal to the equilibrium. Fine. So we've, I've added two people here. 
person A and person D. Now, it happens that I put them on the demand curve, so you can imagine that these are both buyers. See, these are people that buy milk. And when I did the survey, knocked on people's doors in Montreal, this thought experiment, these are, these are the people that answered. But they're different. Uh, these, two, uh, these two people, while they're both buyers, they're quite different given the equilibrium, the price, the current market price of $2.60. We can see it this way. The vertical distance between the demand curve and the horizontal axis gives us an idea of how much the person is willing to pay to buy milk. So, for example, person A uh, and person B are different because person A is willing to pay as much as $2.80 for milk, but the market price is only two sixty. Whereas person B, on the other hand, is only willing to pay two dollars and fifty cents, but the market price is two sixty. So what we can say is the distinction between A and B is that well, A, when given the opportunity to buy milk at two sixty, buys it. Person B, on the other hand, walks away and doesn't buy. Uh, before buying something, I often do this. I think in my mind, well, what would I be willing to pay for something? And um, I know in some cases, like a cup of coffee in the morning, I'd be willing to pay quite a bit. So someone like me, I'd be way up here, if I could draw myself, uh, I'd be willing to pay, and I know I've done this, uh, as much as $10 or more for a cup of coffee in the morning. Of course, when I go to Tim Hortons to buy a cup of coffee, I don't tell them this, and I'm happy because I only have to pay whatever the price is, $2 and $2.20, something like that for a cup of coffee. So in effect, I benefit quite a bit. The difference between what I'm willing to pay and what, I'm, I'm, what I actually have to pay. I don't reveal that, that, that amount of truth, but I certainly reveal the, the, the truth that I'm willing to pay more than the market price. Why? Because I actually purchased the item. Sometimes you hesitate. Sometimes you're down here at this point here, let's say, and uh, you're very, very close to the equilibrium price, the market price. And so you hesitate. You say, well, geez, if it were a bit cheaper, I might buy it. If it were a bit more expensive, I wouldn't. You can play these games in your head if you want to. Let's take a look at two more people now. Uh, we've got person C and person D. I'll get rid of these uh, situations here. We've got person C and person D now. Well, they're on the supply curve. So these are sellers. They're, these are the dairy farmers. But they're different too. So uh, we can sort of see it this way. Person D is the vertical distance now between the horizontal axis and the supply curve tells us the willingness to sell something. Person D is willing to bring their milk to Montreal at $2.40. Person C, on the other hand, would be willing to bring it at $2.70. So the vertical distance here is the willingness to sell. Uh, if you've accepted a job, a part-time job, um, then whatever, let's say the wage is $15 an hour. Well, you're like person D if you've accepted the job because that means you're willing to sell your time for less than 50. How much less, we don't know, but we can say it's less than 15 because you accepted the job. If, on the other hand, you've said, I don't want to work, school is more important, and you said, I'm not going to have a part-time job, then you're like person C. You're saying, I'm not going to sell my time for the $15 they're paying me. So the difference between person C and person D is person C is somebody who walks away, doesn't sell. Either they do something else, uh, they sell their milk elsewhere, they sell it to the cheese guy down the road. Uh, person D, on the other hand, is the person that participates in the market. So in a sense, what we can say is the, the, what makes the market are these two people, or groups of people, rather, people in group A and people in group D. Keep in mind, for something like milk, too, I mean, there could be, there's degrees to how much you'd want to buy. So in some cases, you'd buy some milk, but you wouldn't buy more, and, and so on. Um, this, this sounds very anodyne, very simple, but it's extremely important because what, in effect, the price does, this price of $2.60, it creates a dividing line where it's possible to say, in the case of buyers, we're on this side, and the case of sellers, we're on this side. And this is extremely important information. People frequently don't always tell the truth. They don't tell you what they think, what they feel. But in this case, the market forces people to reveal their true feelings about something because, in effect, the only way you can get the thing you want is by buying it. And uh, the logic of it here, too, is why would you lie? Why would you purchase something that you don't want? I mean, people may do things like this, but largely they don't. And uh, this... This piece of information that uh, you reveal to the market, in a, uh, underneath it all, makes the market function the way it does, and, and it, uh, it's, it leads to efficiency.